Hi, Paul Bedford here from Retention Guru. And in this short video filmed back at the beginning of 2024, I'm talking to Hannah from uh, Prio Sport in Sweden about the differences between the Swedish market, the Nordic markets and the rest of Europe and how that's impacted member behavior, both in the short term and in the long term. Now, if you've got any questions for me, please put them in the comments down below. Alternatively, you can email me at paul at retentionguru.co.uk and I'll be happy to get back to you. For now, enjoy the video and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Take care. Bye. Yeah, it's a lot about um, the personal growth, but yeah. also it's also a lot about the social aspect of it, I guess. Yeah, and I think the thing that I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about this more recently is about building an exercise identity. So helping our members build this identity. I'm the type of person that exercises. I'm the type of person that goes to the gym. I'm the type of person that has a gym membership, even if I'm not using my gym membership. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we, when new people start, they don't have that identity. They look at the people in the gym and go, those gym people, and they think of themselves as different. What we need to do is think about our visits and when they visit, how do we start to encourage and develop that identity of I'm an exerciser? And some of that is the personal touch. Some of it's personal growth. Some of it's about using the equipment we've got more specifically. You know, clubs are spending a lot of money on you know, the, 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 the equipment in a club, but then they almost just leave it for the customer to try and work out how to use it and to self discover, you know, all the different programs on the cardio and things. And I don't think that's sufficient. I think if you want someone to really engage in your business, become part of your community, you have to give them a helping hand. You have to guide them in some way. True. Very good. Uh, on, on this note, I'll, I actually have one more question. Fine. Uh, you, can, you can see more and more on gyms around that they kind of expand the businesses. Yeah. And they add like smoothie bars or small shops or maybe a seating area. Yeah. How does this affect uh, how members come back? Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, I get it. I get it. So we've done some research just recently um, for a big operator in the US and we've done some research in the past on member length and secondary spend. And what we saw was that it takes a while for people to get into the habit of spending extra money per visit. So they come for the first visit, they train, they leave. Over time, if you've got things like smoothie bars and areas for people to dwell, they will start to use them. But to start with, they'll use them on a more ad hoc basis. I'll grab a coffee today before I head into work or I'll have my lunch here because it's easier to have lunch here than try and find it somewhere else. But the more they see the value in that, the more frequently they do it. And after about six months, you can get people up to about 40% extra spend per month above wow. the value of their membership. Now, we know that's true in the mid-market, in the higher-end clubs. We don't know what it is like in the, in the low-cost clubs or the budget clubs because they have less options for secondary spend. Um, but if you take some of the boutiques, you know, they're wrapping up a visit with a smoothie and some other things so that it's not just the workout, it's additional things. So it can have a really big impact. But you get into the habit of yeah. linking things together. You know, I, I fly a lot, I travel a lot, and I particularly fly out of one airport, and I know Stockholm Airport really well. And I'm like, okay, if I'm flying, if I get there, I know where I'm going for my coffee. I know which shops I might, have, might browse for a little while. I know where the quiet seating areas are because the airport I, have, I go to doesn't have lounges. And I know that by the time I get on the flight, I probably will have already spent 20, 30 euros, you know, yeah. or even, you know, I even know I'm going to have lunch in a particular restaurant and I know the menu well enough that it'll be one of three main things. That's the type of behavior we want from our members. 
We want to get them used to coming in, working out, grabbing a smoothie to go, working out, dwelling for 30 minutes, buying a coffee, um, spending time, you know, creating relationships with others. It has a really big impact, but you've got to have it and it's got to be of quality. You can't yeah. because you you can't just sell coffee because, you know, it's like um, in Sweden, it's like uh, it, uh, is it Espresso House? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, almost Espresso House. Yeah, that's who I'm competing with as a club. Yeah. If I start to put on coffee and things like that, and I have to think, is the co the quality of my experience equal to or better than what I can get from Espresso House? Because if it okay. isn't, maybe I should focus on something else. Yeah. And I think small clubs, you know, have the opportunity to really, and I know they're small physically, but the, the area where people can meet after a workout, after group exercise or small group training has massive value. And we saw that with businesses like SoulCycle historically, where people would come and do their spinning class. When they finished, they'd all hang around outside talking to each other. And they, they really um, understood that as a business and they ended up creating their workout brand branded clothing where they'd have 12 different uh, releases of clothing per year one a month limited edition and people came and did their class then they spent 100 euros on a pair of leggings and 70 euros yeah. on a tank top to be yeah. part of that community so it can have a really big value